Hi, Sonal. I finished reading your wonderful collection of short stories a little while ago, and it has stayed with me since. These are uh, short stories which are threaded together by time and location. And I'm most curious, Sonal, what made you think of a collection of short stories for your debut? Because, you know, most people decide to go in for the novel rather than short stories. So that's something I've been meaning to ask you. Uh, hi, Kiran. Uh, thank you first for having this conversation with me. And thank you to the Bangalore Literary Festival for this, for giving me this platform. Um, I think uh, my choice uh, to write a short story collection was uh, was not deliberate, it was quite spontaneous. It was my first time attempting writing. I, I, I did not have a writing background. I mean, now I have a master's in creative writing, but back when, when I started writing, I, I had a bachelor's in economics. So I did not have a degree in literature or writing. So I think attempting a novel was, was something that I did not even think about it. It felt too, too you know, big a project to me. So I, I thought, you know, as a, first time writer uh, as a debut writer attempting short stories would be would be more feasible so so i think that that was one of the reasons i i started writing short stories and also i think i i i, I sort of loved the form even before i started writing them and as i wrote them i i just you know fell so much in love with with this its compactness its brevity its you know capacity to pack worlds in within few pages that I continued to write them. What is uh, amazing, Sonal, in your short stories is the fact that though they are short stories, there's such a wealth of detailing. There are little details, the, uh, the band-aids uh, at the back of her leg, you know, to prevent the shoe bites and the ballerinas. Somebody is, uh, has got a shower cap, the Ram Ratan has a shower cap on when he's bringing in a cake. These little details have been part of our everyday life, you know, for years. And we've re never really thought of them in the sense when you read them, you know that, you know, the, we've all seen this. But what made you, I mean, it's a delicate balance in a short story to put in the detail or to prune out. How was, what was your process like? I think, uh, I mean, pruning out was never a problem for me because I'm a minimalist. So, I mean, even when I, now I, when, you know, I think I did not realize this while I was writing, but now when I look back at my stories, I can see that, you know, I try to capture an image with as few, with as little details as possible and let the reader fill in the rest uh, so that, you know, the image really stands out rather than trying to clutter it. And as for, you know, choosing these details, it's very hard for me to think how I did it because that's how I see the world as a person and, you know, as a reader. And, you know, when I came to writing that, that was what I sort of, th those were the visuals I had. And so I just put them down on paper. I, you know, there was nothing else that I could attempt writing. And so this was, this was what I knew and I wrote that. Lovely. Also the universe in which you've set your stories. It's from the 1980s of De Delhi in the 1980s to I think the 2010s, that's what I read. And what I understand from the reading of it. Was there any specific, of course, they're connected with this thread of Kavya's story and Kavya's life. But Kavya is this girl in the first story and she's the girl in the later story who's uh, grown up and a little older. So while they connect, disconnected, they're still connected. So what was the... Uh, crux, uh, what was your motivation behind setting it in this universe of Delhi of the 1980s? Is it a familiar, comfortable universe that you grew up in and, you know, you you knew very well? Yes, I think exactly that. I mean, it was, it, it was, it's the city that I grew up in. I went to school there. I went to college there. And I sort of, you know, living there almost all my life, I, I understood the city so well. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's language, it's temperament, it's people, it's a way of living, the seasons, you know, everything. And and as a writer, I wanted to capture my city uh, through my work. And uh, I feel that, uh, uh, you know, fiction is a very uh, beautiful way of accessing a city, whether it's Dublin through Joyce or, you know, Boston through Chumpa Lehri's work. And uh, it was in, in a way, maybe my ode to my city, 
absolutely and it's a beautiful road what i do like in your stories is these are everyday stories there is no great drama there's no great moment there's no uh, nothing that is you know going to strike you in the chest but there are little moments of realization sprinkled throughout and also there are stories of uh, women in cotton circumstances which are uh, very uh, i wouldn't say difficult but they're trying to so to speak so you have pushpa uh, in the story who is a woman who has come through after partition and she is struggling hard to make herself and there's uh, there is a case which is looking down on her yet empathetic you know there are both these contrary uh, gazes simultaneously would you uh, would you say that you've been trying to uh, partition has been one important motive in your stories or the characters in your stories um I, you know when i started writing i i did not think that you know a partition would be an important part of this uh, book or, or the stories but i think it was an important part of uh, these characters lives That's and thus it you know became part of the book that pushpa and yamuna you know they lived in lahore before the partition and they they got married and and the partition happened and both of them moved to delhi and they sort of lost touch with each other and their other friends and their network and and you know so in that way it became part of of it was a part of their and it, and i think neither of them are bitter about this experience and it has uh, affected both of them differently like uh, you know yamuna's family is able to reestablish itself they have a prosperous business they are doing well they have sort of you know embraced the new world the new times they they had a brass utensil business back in lahore and they've moved to the new age metal which is stainless steel and they're doing well while pushpa she's you know uh, her she's uh, uh, her family life is not so good her husband has as good as cast her away and she's now fallen back on her you know uh, skill, skills that she learned as a child of sewing and embroidering and she's making uh, uh, do with you know with with those skills and she's providing for herself and her son but i think somewhere she has lost the network that she would have had in 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 lahore with her friends with her neighbors and she 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 she's you know she's had a hard life but she's still trying to you know make do and create a life of her own and i i i mean and there's another character in the book which is um, mr lamba's mother who's who seems to be you know suffering from alzheimer's or dementia and the only thing she can remember is her brother who she had lost during the partition so she's someone who's very you know personally affected by the partition that's true so i do see partition i also to see a theme of friendship and kinship between women and a lot of solidarity and uh, relationships that may be uh, like selina and kavya it's like a fleeting thing but still it has lasted with her or hema and shirley is it hema i think it's hema yeah, yeah. and shirley which has you know crossed continents but still is constant pushpa and her yamuna and uh, so many others so this women bonding together either in friendship and solidarity or with a certain amount of uh, you know fascination so what drives what drove you to write about women's friendships i see a lot of that in the stories i think it's something that you know i as a person value and you know my relationships with my friends and especially like female friends and also you know male friends it's uh, i think uh, next to your familial relationships it's it's one of the greatest bonds that we have and um, um i i think probably that as, as a child as a grown up i have i've sought a lot of comfort in my friendship so i think that might be an inspiration must have been my inspiration in writing these stories but they're lovely also there's a story about two brothers i forget the title of the story who are in a, a certain business and yeah, through the story exactly. yeah and uh, through the story while you're detailing how they're tr- trying to get you also somehow telling us how they're growing apart while you don't say it very obviously and that story is like a microcosm of new india so to speak how things have changed so did at any point you fe- did you feel like you were sort of chronicling the stories of those who were coming through after the post liberalization and how their lives were changing through that entire yeah. economic change in the country yes, I, i think you're very right in picking that up that was 
I mean, apart from uh, wanting to tell the story of these two brothers who have built a prosperous business and, you know, they have a prosperous partnership, but uh, at the same time, they have a very complex and conflicting sibling relationship, which is, you know, full of doubts and misgivings and mistrust and ego. And, you know, there's a whole power dynamics going on while they're just sitting in the car and enjoying kebabs and, you know, listening to guzzles. There's, there's these undercurrents of, you know, uh, of a very strange relationship. Uh, but at the same time, I also, because it's a uh, they, they have built a business and they've built a business in, you know, uh, post-liberalization, you know, they, they've sort of been able to uh, ride the boom of liberalization. And so I wanted to capture that part of, of you know, Indian economic history through through this story. I think somewhere my background in economics, you know, made me made me want to tell this this little bit as well because you know I, I felt that you know it was something that I knew well as as, as you know as an era of liberalization. So I wanted to use that uh, in, in the story. And I, I felt that it 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 explained their their you know their rise as a family as a business. Also, a very fascinating character who is only hinted at and doesn't really come into the story is the person who has suddenly become very prosperous, the person who was not, uh, who pays for their kebabs at the end. So, this yeah. is this the new Delhi that happened uh, post liberalization, the sudden, the wealth that uh, we all saw, it was yes. all of a sudden? I, 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 th I think, uh, you know, everybody who's lived in Delhi knows this one person who's risen from from nothing to everything and you know he he uh Ravi Su this is the character's Oops. name and he embodies that uh that that person that we know that you know he was a clerk in uh, steel authority India limited and from being a clerk he's become a person who owns multiple businesses from manufacturing to export and import and and it's it's also how people look at him has changed you know earlier he would he would visit the brother's factory and you know they, he would just uh, you know, collect this steel scrap and sell it in the uh, market at Narayana, but, and they would never pay him any heed. But now they say that when he visits, he's, he's like, he's brought into the office and they probably offered coffee or tea. And, and so it, uh, how people look at him has also changed. Yeah. Another thing about this entire economic boom was the story where Simi's Koti is going to be changed, sold off. And, uh, she is sort of mentally adjusting to the change that her life will take. Yes. And uh, her, and that story has got so many layers about her not being married, about her friend being married, you know, married, but there was a squint that came after the marriage. So she's not really sure whether she's happy in a marriage. There's so much of underlying uh, layers that you don't really tell us. Uh, what inspired this particular story? Um, I, I think uh, this uh, sort of uh, old Delhi, which mm -hmm. is crumbling and falling apart and no longer in vogue, but still sort of royal, but but in a crumbling way, I think that uh, the the image of a house like that, and you know what what uh, uh, what its occupants might feel in in this changing world, I think that that inspired uh, the story. An okay. old crumbling bungalow, which is on the cusp of being sold and probably, you know, uh, being brought down and turned into a multi-storied apartment building. I, I, I think the, the sort of uh, property boom, <laughs> again, inspire, inspired that story. And of all your stories, of course, uh, there was one that was very touching. That was the story of Johnny Walker. You know, he's like Ralph Ellison's Invisible oh. Man. And, uh, uh, the house, the whole that he works, he's just uh, there for the massages to do all the tasks. But he also has a life of his own. He also has visions of his own. And Rani comes to his, uh, makes him feel more complete, more human. So there were a lot of, uh, you know, taboos that you took on in this story. Could you tell us a little bit more about it? Because there's some very touching scenes and there are scenes where you know that, you know, uh, this is what it was like, and it perhaps still is. Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I agree. Johnny Walker's, you know, personal story, it seems a very sensitive, you know, story. And he, he's uh, lived 
and worked for this family almost enti his entire adult life. I think from the time when he was 15 to now when he's 50 in the story. And he feels uh, like he this is his family and he's a family member. And even, even the family makes him feel like he belongs to them and, until uh, the time comes when you know the family decides to move to the US and uh, sort of sell the house and their business. And, and at that point, he becomes disposable to the family. And uh, they just feel that, you know, they, they, they'll set him up with their daughter's family. And if they ever come back, they can have him back. And it's almost like they're treating him like a piece of property. And um, I feel that uh, Johnny Walker, perhaps all his life, did not see himself as a person and more like a like a you know like a household help he, he saw himself as a household help but he could see himself as a person only when rani comes into his life and and he feels like a man then like a person with desires a person who would want a family or a house of his own and um, but here too i think he, he's he's having a hard time because uh, rani is a low caste sweeper and because uh, johnny walker feels that uh, you know he belongs he almost has adopted the caste of the family that he works for, and he feels that it's a mismatched, imbalanced, uh, you know, match. And he's always worried whether the family would accept Rani or not. And, you know, I mean, he could easily have, uh, you know, given up this job and gone ahead and, you know, made a life with Rani. There, there are many people in the market, it seems, who, who would want to hire him. You know, like there's the sweet shop who, who knows that he's a hard worker and, you know, he's an honest you know a uh, person and it, he's very interested in hiring him so he I mean he I'm and he has a lot of contacts in the city so he could have very easily you know given up on this family and started his own own you know uh, family with Rani and gotten a new job but it seems that he, all that is unthinkable to him he's he's somehow just tied with this old couple that he's living with and in the end he he uh, he has a sour deal that was very uh, bittersweet, the end. Yeah. One way you were, let me not give the end of it, <laughs> whoever's watching. But uh, tell me, there are a lot of influences I see in your writing. There's Farida Khanu, there is uh, Aparna Sen, there's 36 Chorangi Lane. There's a lot of the culture, popular culture of that time. Uh, so uh, were these things that you grew up with and that you've drawn upon and how did you decide what fitted in where did it, I mean, uh, Selena's mother watching 36 Chorangi Lane was like such a perfect uh, fit into the whole scenario uh, I mean uh, it was uh, again uh, a little spontaneous and a little delicate thought thought over and deliberate I mean I had watched 36 Chorangi Lane maybe maybe 10 or 15 years ago and I absolutely loved the movie and um, when when the time came to you know write the story and you know there's there's this section where Selena's uh, old mother and you know it it's a scene in their house where uh, Kavya goes to visit them and the mother is shelling peas and uh, Selena wants her mother to you know now have her soup and you know have her dinner but the mother refuses to eat and she's very hell bent on you know just shelling the peas and ignoring her soup so at last Selena turns on the television and you know the mother starts to have a soup and so it's her way of coaxing her mother to to eat and you know I thought what would be a good movie for them to be and it's a movie that they keep watching over and over and over again because you know uh, the print is a little run out uh, so so I, I, I mean, I thought quite a bit, what could they be watching? Could it be a, 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 you know, a show on the television or could it be a movie? And I had several options and I spent, I think, quite a lot of time thinking about it. And then finally, 36 Charangilin, like the right movie for them, because I mean, one, they're Anglo-Indians and I thought it might be a story, 36 Charangilin is the story of an Anglo-Indian woman. It might be a story that would interest them. And it's also the story of a, a woman who's living alone in old age and she's also a teacher like selena was so i just felt that you know it might resonate with them on several levels and work well for the story it did it fitted in beautifully tell us uh, what is your writing process like this is a typical question that you know we all get asked but as a writer i'm always curious about everyone's writing process how do you go about? Do you draft an outline, or are you organic? Are you the plotter, or are you the panster? Uh, I I uh, f I think at first I just 
think a lot about everything, sort of the scene in the movie, the characters. I try to, you know, see the scenes in my head as though I'm watching a movie. And uh, at this point, I'm, I just make a lot of rough notes, you know, uh, this scene, this scene, the characters, you know, some traits about the character. And I, I spend quite a lot of time just doing this, uh, you know, pacing up and down and thinking about the story. And then when I feel I've, you know, thought enough, I have enough material in my head. I just sit and in one sitting, I, I write out the whole story, whatever comes to me. And at this point, I'm, I don't, uh, you know, intend to get it right. And the scenes can be jumbled up and uh, the grammar, the tense. I mean, nothing has to be right. I just want to get everything out so that, you know, um, because I'm a, I'm a slow and deliberate writer, if I am to write everything, you know, one, one thing at a time, I think uh, the story probably would not have spontaneity. It'll, look like you know uh, interjections and so uh, I, I want to create the whole story in one go and then go over it very slowly very meticulously I mean um, I, I then I, I after I've written it out I try to write it longhand I try to rearrange the scenes and then I, I type it again then I write it longhand again then I type it again I feel that you know it's like writing it longhand slows me down it makes me uh, if I'm reading it on the screen, I'm glossing over things I, I know. And but when I'm writing down, it makes me weigh every word and comma and be 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 careful about everything. And I, in a very perverse way, I like this process, <laughs> the slowness of it, and I enjoy it. So so I think that that's my process. That's very interesting. Writing longhand, I should try it sometime because I know that I sometimes speak too fast and then read it in the in the book and say, uh. Oh, so I completely get what you, you say. Tell us, what are you working on now, Sonal, after this collection? Uh, I'm working on a novel uh, set in Delhi again in the 90s. And it's set over two or three months in the monsoon season. I felt that that was something that I missed in this book. And, and you know, the monsoon, now that I'm living away from India and Delhi, it, I mean, I, I just miss the seasons. And I think it's my way of sort of living that again through my writing wonderful thanks so much Soral for telling us about your book and uh, it's a lovely book it's right here for those who might want to read it it's called the house next to the factory it's a connection a collection of nine stories in uh, Kavya's life around the factory but the, this girl she comes in two stories but it's a lovely lovely little collection of short stories and of people we all know some how are the other? We know these people in these stories. So I look forward to reading more of your work, Sonal, all the very best. Thank Thanks you, Kevin. Thank so you much. So much.